election in Florida and Ginny Thomas testifies. The breakdown starts now. Welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson, and we have a packed show for you tonight. But of course, we cannot go without mentioning the absolute devastation in Florida from Hurricane Ian. Rick, you are a Floridian. My aunt lives in Florida. We have family there, as do you. Uh, just absolutely heartbreaking, devastating uh, photos and videos coming out of Florida. And it's um, it's it's tough to tough to watch. Are you OK? Is your family OK? We're we're, we're more than my family. My family's in Tampa primarily. Um and, uh, and they were spared the brunt of the storm, although for a while it looked like it was headed straight to them. Um, and I've got some other family out in, uh, in Imperial Polk County, which is to the east of Tampa. And uh, they, they are fine. They're checking in fine. Um, but, man, we are seeing stuff out of Naples, uh, Fort Myers, uh, Sanibel, Sanibel Island. Uh, Ca yeah, uh, Captiva. And up to Orlando. Orlando, you know, that underwater looks, Orlando. That looks like the flooding in there is tremendous. Um, it's, it's a major humanitarian crisis right now. Um, we don't have death counts yet in a lot of these places. I am hopeful most people evacuated. Um, you know, most Floridians will try to tough out, as we talked about the other night, a one or right. a two. Um, but this was a four just south of a five on landfall. Two miles an hour short of a two five. Two miles an hour. And so, you know, it, people do not recognize until um, they see some of this video that the, the power of a 10-foot wall of water coming at your community. And some of the pictures we're seeing are, you know, neighborhoods are just flattened. It's, so, it's really uh, incredible. And yeah. I have to say we have uh, my, my aunt is okay. She, she lives in the Bradenton area, but she evacuated <laughs> thinking it was going that way to her best friend's house in Arcadia area, which oh, got well, no, a direct hit. It was way worse. Right. It was a direct yeah. hit. Um, she's got three dogs and you know, they were, she was, she was texting with me. Thankfully she never lost cell power, but they did lose power and some trees were down, not too much damage to yeah. her house where she was. Thank God, but um, lots of devastation in that in the neighbors, you know, neighboring areas. It, it just it's really, really um, stressful. Uh, my parents used to live in the Florida Keys for like 20 years, and you know, hurricane season was just never a fun time for us every year. Um, but uh, we have friends in the Fort Myers area that did not evacuate. I told them they could come to my house here in Virginia if they needed to, please get out, and they said, No, no. We have not heard from them, so we don't know how they're doing. And I just don't understand people who don't evacuate when you see a storm of the magnitude of, of Hurricane Ian barreling down on you. I mean, Mother Nature doesn't play around. Really, how many times really do we have to go through those, this? It, it, it really is one of those things where, um, and I know some people can't afford to evacuate. I understand that. <laughs> Our friends could have. <laughs> a, <lot of> <laughs> a lot of those communities are extraordinarily affluent. Yes. And and I I... I have to tell you, we, 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 like I said, we don't know the death toll yet. We don't know the, the count yet. We're hopeful that, the, you know, Florida's improved building codes over the last 20 years or so uh, are going to save some lives here. But the, it, the economic costs, we're not even, we're not even close to understanding what they are. No. And, you know, there are two and a half million people in Florida without power. Uh, Still right now. Hours. It, 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 I don't know what the current number is at the moment, but I think, I think it had improved a little bit, but um. But that's because so many of the areas are impassable. I mean, the, yeah. the the fact that the Sanibel Causeway was washed away is insane, which means the people in Sanibel are basically, you're unable to get to them unless you have a boat. Right. And uh, right. that's you know, considerable. Um, and, you know, God bless all of the the linemen and the, you know, electric and power company folks that come from all over that were staged yeah. and ready to go. That is not easy work. It's dangerous. Um, right. And they have I a lot of work. racing down I-10 from the West. Yeah. Uh, yep. racing down I-10 the other day, and it was a it was a convoy. I, I'm not exaggerating. It was probably 75 trucks. I believe it, yeah. Had, 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 rolling hard for South Florida, and God bless them. And uh, the Cajun Navy folks uh, are, are arriving now. Yep. Um, it, is, it is, you know, look, look folks, the, one of the great things about America is we really do come together in a moment like this. 
And there are just a lot of folks right now who are wondering what they can do. We have posted on our Twitter feed a couple times of ways you can help folks in South Florida right now. Uh, we'll do that again. But, you know, and I've actually tried to take a, you know, a, a beat here on the, a lot of the politics today yeah. because we don't know how bad it is for so many people. And it is a very serious moment for the state. And Florida is the third largest state in the country now. And, and it's grown so quickly and that, that a lot of people's connections to one another in their neighborhoods are tenuous. Mm-hmm. And I'm really hopeful that, that people will come together down there and, and pull for their neighbors and, and help their friends. Um, and, and, and that we can bounce back from this quickly because it is it, it is going to devastate the state economically. Um, yeah, I, I'll be curious to see how DeSantis handles this since the state was so grossly unprepared before this. Um, sometimes disasters like this can make yeah. or break a governor's uh, a governor's governorship. Um, it made Jeb Bush we'll a star see. in Florida we'll uh, where he handled his hurricanes. We'll see how DeSantis does this. But in the spirit of... Um, of helping out because I know there's so many people, the Lincoln project uh, universe, there is a universe of very generous people who are compassionate. And I personally like to focus on the smaller, more direct on the ground charities. I mean, you can donate to the red cross and, and, you know, uh, salvation army and all that. If you want to, I feel those organizations spend way too much overhead instead of direct services. And they're overly bureaucratic most of the time. So yeah. I wanted to make sure that we gave our viewers an opportunity because I know there's a lot of people out there that are like, how can we help to um, give a couple of charities that you can, donate to to help out that will get directly to people in need immediately. First, of course, is World Central Kitchen. That is Jose Andres and his absolutely amazing operation on the front lines. He's been all over the world in these types of disaster zones, helping people um, and feeding, you know, thousands and thousands of people. So there's World Central Kitchen. That's Jose Andres. Um, If you want to donate to him, great cause. Another local uh, organization is called Farm Share. It's a grassroots organization in Florida, nonprofit, and they source leftover fruits and vegetables from farms and they distribute them to people across the state. They are amassing truckloads of food to help supply Floridians that are in shelters who are homeless now, who need meals. And that is a local nonprofit in Florida. It's called Farm Share. That's another charity that you can consider. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, Moving on, there's other news going on here. Uh, still praying for our folks in Florida and South Carolina, by the way. This thing is now turned into a hurricane again. It looks like it's going to hit South Carolina. So, guys, please listen, heed the warnings, pay attention, please. and um, you know, yeah. don't be don't be. Guys, it only far. takes a few hours out in the in the water to to steam up again. So that's right, on. which it has. It's back to a hurricane, Cat One, yeah. but still, you know. So, all right, I, I've been doing some. Some people are fe- giving me feedback. We're going to add these. To, we're not going to go through them now. We're going to put more of these on the Twitter feed. Um, there are a ton of uh, groups trying to help out for yes. people, for seniors, for animals, for everything else. Yep. And it's going to take a lot. It is going yes. to take a lot. Yep. This is not Indeed. a trivial, not a trivial uh, storm. No. Um, one last thing, Bo, before. Did you see some of the videos of these idiots that had the fuck Joe Biden's uh, flags that were standing out there in, in the middle of this thing? I mean, really, people... Irwin's waiting room. <laughs> I, that's what I said. Irwin's I said, waiting room. Where's a bolt of lightning when you need it? What a bunch of jerk-offs. They're not patriots. They're jerk-offs. All right, they really, moving on. They really are. And by the way, one other, one other quick yeah. thing. There are reports now of people looting in, in Southwest Florida. Get your fucking shit together, people. Stop it. Yeah. Stop Come it. On. Come on. Come on. Come on. What are we doing? What are we doing here? This is 2022. Yeah. Um, well, we I did not mention at the top of the show, but I will mention it now that we do have one of our uh, fan favorites and senior advisors extraordinaires, Stuart Stevens, joining us today to talk a little politics because there's some stuff going on here. And um, we're going to bring Stu in right now. Let's bring him in to finish the rest of this conversation tonight. Stu, welcome back. Stuart. It's always good to have you, buddy. Hey, guys. Great to see you. Glad to see that uh, you're putting in the word about that animal shelter. I'd never heard of that place before. Yeah. Um, 
Big Dog, it's called? Big Dog Ranch Rescue. Wow. And not only are they the biggest... Yeah, not only are they the biggest no-kill shelter in the U.S., there has been such a demand because they said there was a 50% rise in people um, getting rid of their animals for a variety of reasons, whether they can't afford them anymore or, you know, they were COVID dogs and or whatever, and that there's a 40% decrease in adoptions. So they've actually secured a, a former Greyhound racing facility that's been shut down, thank God, in Alabama. Alabama for a second location. It has 16 buildings. They're going to have a vet clinic in it so, because they have such a demand that they've gotten, um, they, they've, sec- they've secured this facility in Alabama now to help expand Great. what they're doing. So yeah, well, they're an amazing organization. Yeah, God love them. We should all look them up and send them some money. Yes. we. I'm, I'm on it. We shall. Do, do your thing, Lincoln Project Universe. <laughs> um, so Stu, we're going to uh, do a hard turn, as they say. And talk a little politics now. Um, Our favorite Supreme Court justice's cuckoo wife, Ginny Thomas, testified today. And um, it looks like, from what we hear, Betty Thompson, the congressman who's the head of the January 6th committee, said that she continued to say that she believes that the 2020 election was stolen. Like, dead serious, still still believes it, and... well. I mean, look, Tar, you, that just puts her in the mainstream. Um, <laughs> you, 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 you can't say that's that's a kooky opinion. I mean, that, that one is held by the majority. Even McCarthy of the believes the same thing. Right, apparently. You, you know, what, what you have Well, to the kooky parts is, are that the that she thought that the Biden crime family was going to be on barges yeah. on their way to Gitmo, uh, along with uh, a journalist who were arrested. Yeah, we saw if, that, that if, text. If, yeah, if you really believe that's Biden and not a stand-in, but um, <laughs> you know, it it, it uh, it's it's really uh, what's so amazing to me. Looking ahead, the twenty-four presidential election is going to be unlike any other because it's impossible to imagine Republicans. I mean, we think Trump will probably be the nominee, but whoever is the nominee is it's impossible to imagine that person is going to assert affirmatively that Donald Trump lost the election and Joe Biden's a legal president. So for the first time, um, we're going to have a presidential race, not between two parties with different views, but one party that believes they're running to depose an illegal occupant in the White House, right. which, I mean, <laughs> just think about that. Um, and and it, it sounds ridiculous, but then when you follow that through, it's a short walk to so much of this violence, because if you really believe that we have an illegal president who's occupying the, the you know, commander in chief illegally, not only do you have a right to do something about that, but maybe you have a moral obligation. That's the key here. That's the key. That's the through line here to the violence, to the, you know, the mobilization of the crazies to act on this. They're activating them because they believe, you know, uh, our good friend Denver Riggleman was on MSNBC earlier today. And he's had, he said something really profound. He said, faith is more powerful than facts. Yeah. And that these people have believe it is their their God's calling in their lives to do this. It's their patriotic duty. It's what God is calling them to do. And the, the facts don't matter. The faith is stronger than facts. And that's scary. Yeah, you know, that whole I had, I had a client once who uh, was running in a primary and all the other opponents were saying that God uh, wanted them to win. And my client had the opinion that God probably didn't follow the tracking and had bigger, bigger things to deal with. Than <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> This particular race. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, you know, the thing that always gets me is that when you say that, then so then when you lose, does that mean that like God was wrong? I mean, right. well, how do you, that's <laughs> right. like, you know, well, how, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? I, I never could quite figure that out. Yeah, that's a tough um, one. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it, all of our friends uh, who said, why not just humor Donald Trump? This, 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 he's going to come in 20, you know, in the, in the December period there. Um, and then afterwards, right. where you have people that we know to be fundamentally sane are endorsing uh, election deniers. Well, look at Glenn Youngkin. So Glenn Youngkin, the whole right. thing about Glenn Youngkin, right, was, look, you know, this is just a, a show. He's really a normal human being. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't believe any of this bullshit, which to me is a very odd defense of someone. He really doesn't believe what he's saying, but right. take, that as a, take that as it will. So, but here he gets elected governor. He He's ambitious. And to be ambitious and advance in the party now, this party that we all used to belong to, um, 
you have to be willing to endorse people who are stark raving lunatics and a danger to the country and a danger to their states, like Terry Lake. Yeah. So, you know, Glenn Young and Mr. Like Normal goes out and stands next to, like, right. Miss, you know, Miss, I want to, the federal government, uh, fire the federal government from Arizona. Um, and it, it's just kind of, I think, a little parable of what happened so much with Donald Trump. I mean, I think there was a lot of people who had doubts about Donald Trump, but maybe thought he was a little weird. But then, like, their senator or congressman or governor, who they yeah. thought was like, well, that person's normal. They're supporting yeah. Donald Trump. Gave him a permission structure to yep. say, well, oh, I guess exactly. he's okay. To your Glenn Youngkin example, I live here in Virginia, and several of my friends who were uh, former Republicans that were disgusted by Trump, that voted Democrat for the first time in their lives in all the elections, and in 2021, they voted for Glenn Youngkin. They went back home because they said, well, you know, he's 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 not so bad. He's more of a traditional Republican like we used to be. And I said, OK, you, that's what you think. Just, just because he wears the Patagonia vest trying to make himself seem normal. Listen to what he has said to the people in, behind closed doors right. in the fundraisers where he says that when you vote for me, you're voting for MAGA. You know, he he wasn't lying about that. And now, like you said, he's ambitious. He won't answer the question. He was asked recently, right. will he serve out his entire term? It's he only is. four years and you can't run for re-election. Right. So it's a bunch of exactly. I mean, yeah, you know, and, he, and he's I like, think, oh, well. Uh, this is the, Sarah Palin, the, the Sarah Palin career route to greatness. Not <laughs> finishing out one term. Right, um, right. It's, I mean, like, that's like a college kid gets through four years. You can't get through four years of a pretty cushy job where you can pretty much right. do whatever you want. Don't right. have Exactly. And to your point about, you know, the endorsing the lunatics and, and we have focused, Lincoln Project has really focused on a couple of these races because they are so consequential, given how close the electoral college votes were last time yep. around. States like Pennsylvania and Arizona, where you know it was close, folks. OK, um, you've got these people out in Arizona in, in Carrie Lake, Blake Masters and their secretary of state candidate, uh, Mark Fincham, I think his name is. Who These is people, just up. They wow. are uh, just dangerous. They are worse than Trump in a lot of ways. And uh, Lincoln Project has has uh, given Blake Masters the LP treatment. Let's let's roll it. Every soldier swears an oath, not to politics or party, not to liberal or conservative. They swear an oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I'm Blake Masters. Blake Masters has contempt for our service members who have served and sacrificed for their country with honor and respect. Our military leadership, totally incompetent. Blake Masters has never served. These people get promoted by giving politically correct PowerPoint presentations. And his ideas are an insult to everyone who ever did. Basically, every general above a two-star at this point is some kind of left-wing politician. That's not conservative. They need to be fired and retired. That's not patriotic. You take the most conservative hurdles, you promote them to general. Think about how crazy that is. That's f***ing crazy. <laughs> yes, it is. It is effing crazy. And you know what it is? It is one step up from how Donald Trump disrespected the military and got right. away with it. The story is out this week about what we knew a couple of years ago when Trump went went uh, to Japan and right. he didn't want to see the, the John McCain, the USS John McCain that was there. And we actually saw the, the foiled communications that were going back and forth with the military liaisons and the White House back then about actually making sure that Trump did not see the USS John McCain. The reporting was accurate at the time. It was infuriating. And it's just as infuriating again today. And now we have candidates who are running, who have been more insulting to the military, took it another step, running for Senate in Arizona, won the, won the Republican nomination, and this guy still has a chance. It's just... Mm -hmm indicative of how far the Republican Party is falling. It is, it is striking how it is striking how out of touch Blake Masters is in a state like Arizona, which has one of the highest percentages of veterans in the country. Yeah. And, John McCain was the senator there. And where John McCain was the U.S. <laughs> senator. And, and it's also part of that alternate reality bubble they live in. This trope that that every general gets promoted by giving a woke PowerPoint presentation, you know, 
I, I know a few more people in the at the senior ranks of our military than the average dog. N as far as I can tell, there are very very few promotions handed out for woke powerpoints and yeah. an awful lot for dedicated service. But yeah, call them well, crazy. Coming, but coming from a from a you know venture capitalist uh, guy who wouldn't survive half a half an hour in basic training. OK, and they no. talk about and they're the first ones to talk about masculinity and and, you know, how important it is to be a man's man and blah, blah, blah. Really? And you're disparaging the military. That's just it, it, and it is. It is John McCain. So, you know, going back when, when John McCain moved to Arizona to run um, after he uh, got out of uh, active service in POW, he was in a debate and he was attacked for being basically a carpetbagger. <laughs> and his answer to that was, well, the longest place I ever lived was the Hanoi Hilton. <laughs> Which, yeah. you know, was sort of like a slam dunk and just it was indicative of um, sort of the, the respect that Arizonans have for the military. And this is a guy who wrote that he he didn't think the United States should have fought World War Two. Right? right. I mean, we're not talking about like Grenada or maybe, yeah. you know, Panama, right. or something, but World War Two. Um, I mean, he has some Nazi sympathizer I, I, stuff I, I, in there, doesn't he? Well, he 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 lovingly quoted Herman Goering at one point, which yeah. you know, call me crazy, but uh, I don't view Herman Goering as much of a role model for uh, for for to praise in my writing. Well, maybe him and Madison Cawthorn can go to the Eagle's Nest together on a on a vacation now that Madison Cawthorn has some more time on his hands. <laughs> hey, look, I want to give a shout out. Uh, you were talking about looking at these races, but you know, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. But the Lincoln Project went through a process every organization has to target politically. And the Lincoln Project did, a, uh, I've sat in these rooms for targeting a million times. I've never seen done what the Lincoln Project did. Um, and they uh, looked at the uh, races based on a democracy filter. Mm -hmm. Which races are the biggest threat to uh, democracy uh, in the country? Chickory Olson and Jeff Timmer did it. I thought it was a brilliant idea just to think of it. Like it's, in a way, it's one of these things you go like, Oh, that's so logical. Of course, we should do that. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, they, these are the races they came. With, they, they popped up. I mean, like Pennsylvania, where a, a key state in an electoral uh, college. Um, you know, Rick and I worked in these presidential races where we sat in those rooms trying to win uh, Pennsylvania for Republican. It's incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, he appoints the governor appoints the Secretary of State. And he, look, I mean, the guy's not just an insurrectionist. He didn't just pay people uh, expenses to go and be fellow insurrectionists. He didn't just lie to the FBI about crossing a police line. He has openly said that he will appoint a secretary of state who pretty much will guarantee yep. whoever he wins, whoever he thinks should win, will win. Yes. Um, On top of his views about women's rights and where he thinks, you know, and about, what he thinks about women oh, and, and his anti-Semitism. Anti the non-trivial right. anti-Semitism. And and also my favorite uh, my my favorite uh, voting rights thing he's he said I'm gonna just cancel every voting registration in Pennsylvania and start over because too many of those people are registered really I, I wonder who those people might yeah. be who are those I, I'm, people I'm struggling with that where that could, who that could be hmm. yeah, I mean look you can't say it enough the whole idea of not voting to certify was race based. Because it was the areas that they yeah, questioned the, where the illegitimate votes were, were yep. Fulton County in Atlanta, Detroit, Philadelphia. Um, it, it was these places uh, that were predominantly uh, non-white votes, many of them oh, yeah. African-American. Mm -hmm. And it's just a little telling predictor of how they feel about the country at large and why they're trying so desperately to change voting laws because the country is becoming more non-white and all the Stephen Millers in the world can't change that. We're headed to a, a majority minority country. That's and right. that ultimately is at the, the panic within these people, yeah. instead of asking themselves like, how can we appeal more to these voters? Which well, all, all the time that, that I worked in a party, I, we will freely admit that our greatest failure was not appealing to more African-Americans. We, and Hispanics. You know, and, uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart, you were saying, you know, uh, there would always be that conversation at the beginning of every presidential cycle, like, how are we going to do better with African-American voters? And we got, and it would be, people would be smart around the table and they'd come up with a hard, a hard, hard answer and go, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And then all of us would be like, yeah, okay. Well, I would suspect that there weren't any African-Americans around that table. Not many. 
Uh, exactly. Well, there weren't many in the room either. And the ones who were, were co usually completely out of touch with how to do it. They were there as tokens. Are you saying and, that Alan Keyes is not in touch with the heartbeat uh, of the world? No, <laughs> no. And I can remember, I know firsthand, because when back in the 2002 cycle, after what happened in 2000 with Bush and, and given um, 9-11 and given Bush's position on education and minority home ownership, I, myself and another friend of mine, another black Republican friend who was like my political partner in crime, we approached the RNC with a very modest investment in um, certain key cities and areas that were predominantly African-American mm -hmm. with ways to, to promote what was going on because you can't, it was the Jack Kemp approach to things. People That's don't right. know what you're doing unless you're there and you establish a relationship. You can't just show up six weeks no. before an election and run ads that are very insulting, uh, that are very stereotypical on black radio, thinking that's what black people want to hear. And then that's how you appeal to them and think that's going to work. And we were resoundly rejected. They were unwilling to do this. The RNC told us, you know, no, you know, we have, we're, we're going to continue doing what we're doing. We're not, that it's not going to matter anyway, because they're never voting for us. So we're not, we don't have the money to invest in this. And we were only talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars. It, we weren't talking about millions and millions of dollars. And we just looked at each other and said, this is, this is, <laughs> It was pretty disheartening at the time. And that's when I realized that the party wasn't serious about actually um, reaching out and expanding into into non-traditional voter neighborhoods sure. with that. And it was very frustrating for me. And that's back to 2002. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think one thing we at least admitted it was a failure, yeah. and so. we, which I think is not, uh, you know, is it a difference? I think it's a difference in the sense that you have to admit that you failed to be able to begin a first step to change. We never went through, I think a, a, we never really ask ourselves enough policy questions. Why is it that the policies we have aren't appealing more to those uh, non-white voters? And, and, and a lot to those at the lower economic uh, end of the uh, uh, spectrum, sure. um, regardless of, of race. But um, I think that that was a better place to be than sort of doubling down on this white grievance. Oh, like 100%. Ben, ben yeah. Melman went to the NAACP in what, 2005? Yeah. Um, and, Ken and was actually one of the good ones, I will say. Ken yeah. Melman was very good on this issue, yeah. but he he didn't have a lot of help. And it, it you know, now um, it, it, it's just all of that white anger. It's, I, as I say this about Trump, I don't know if he made people more racist, but I'm sure that he gave people more permission to be openly racist. A hundred percent. No doubt. hundred percent. No doubt. hundred percent. If you ask our good friend, Michael Steele, who yeah. was another one who, when he became RNC chairman, one of the first things he wanted to do was start to invest in, um, in minority areas right. and getting the message out there. And since he was a much better messenger for a number of reasons, and he got so so much pushback on that, so much. And it was an uphill battle for him too, as well. Um, but the, it, you know, this, this, the idea of this after, especially after 2012, when they did the autopsy and came out and realized like, yeah, the obvious, we've got mm -hmm. to appeal to a broader tent of people here, particularly Hispanics on top of everything else. And they threw that playbook out and decided to go with the white grievance part of it. And now I, you, you see know. it in the most ugly ways that, uh, I'm not sure how we put that genie back in the bottle. You know, one of the things that struck me about that so-called autopsy, like you say, it was pretty obvious, but it, it's, look, I think that's one thing I think Ryan Spivers does get credit for. It's hard to be self-critical. They went through this. But then when Trump came along, it was presented not only as a political necessity, but as a moral mandate. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to earn the right to govern this big, changing, cacophonous country, you needed to reflect more what the country was like. Then Trump came along and it was almost this audible sigh of relief. Like, right. thank they God, we're going to have to pretend that we believe in this shit. <laughs> right. You know, we can, That's right. We can just go back to what we were and uh, we can win. And they uh, did. And but, they yeah, did. You know, happy days are here again. Oh, uh, well, let me ask you this, dude. To, uh, switching gears back to the midterms. You know, I kind of feel like Democrats are starting to maybe get a little, you know, start feeling themselves a little bit now, yeah. getting a little bit more confident and finally freaking going out on offense, which we've been saying from day one. What do I say? Defense may win championships, but offense wins elections. Yep. And so 
they're finally starting to do this and and taking it to some of these magas and not letting them get away with their crap. Uh, do you do you feel that they're starting to get this a little bit or what? I, I, I like Look, to see you know, I, I, my, I think we share this frustration um, <laughs> with the Democratic Party. There are more of, of them than there are of the other side. Why not be more confident? Right. Why not act like you really believe we're right, they're wrong? Uh, what, you know, swagger a little here. You know, walk, walk with confidence here. Um, this sort of diffidence and questioning, um, I think, is, is, seems to be almost integral to it. But what, what I like now is um, we have been saying in the Lincoln Project for a long time that democracy was on the ballot. And, and a lot of people push back. And, and look, I get this. It's sort of politics 101. That's too ethereal. That's not something that really right. means anything to people. Um, but as it turns out, it does mean something to people. Because you get in these uh, examples, when you look at what's happening, uh, when Texas is putting a bounty on women who are trying to get abortions, that's part of the democratic process. Because that is an anti-democratic effort. When you have minority rule, and that ultimately is what this is about, not the the uh, what direction the country that the majority wants to go in. So um, I, I think uh, what the president's doing, I, I think, listen, um, go out and do it more. I would try to nationalize the rest of this race along democracy. Um, and look, you know, sometimes uh, good policy is good politics. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats have actually done a lot of important big stuff. And, you know, we can argue about whether or not this bill should have been 1.8 trillion or, or two, but they're getting, Nobody cares. They're, they're getting Nobody stuff cares. done. I mean, the infrastructure bill alone, I mean, Rick and I could, if we could put together a campaign over lunch of how they could sell the infrastructure in of every course. one of these districts. Yes. Uh, and, and the proof of that is you see these Republicans who voted against it bragging about it. Right. They're, they're right. Right. Yes. Well, hey, look, Stefanik votes we're, against we're, it, but she's bragging about it, how great, great it is for her district. Yeah, and they voted against it. And um, they can show this. Just show the yeah. show in their own words. So um, there's, there's big stuff happening, and I think they ought to talk about it. Um, I, I just don't know beyond a couple of the, the president who, you know, they are burdened by still believing that they have an obligation to uh, govern. And, you know, if you think about it every day, how hard it must be in that White House uh, liaison office with Congress. Yeah. You have to go out and deal with people, not who think you're wrong, but think that you're elite, not even president. Right. Which how, is how do you negotiate with these? People? Right. That, that's unprecedented. We've I, never I, had yeah, to deal I with mean, that dynamic before. You know, I mean, you walk in a room and they go, well, you're not here from a legal president. Right. That's how right. do you start that conversation? You go, yeah, well, <laughs> overlooking that. Can we meet halfway? That, like he's halfway legal, you know? Right, <laughs> right. Well, he it, lives it, there just, now. He lives there in the White House now. So it's so, it's so extraordinary. But, you know, I, I think another thing we used to say, we believe, was character's destiny. And maybe that's what's playing out here in this election, that maybe when uh, mm -hmm. you have people who just are incredibly flawed, like Masters, like uh, J.D. Vance, like Terry Lake, like Mastriano. I mean, ultimately, isn't this a character flaw that these people, they, they, they are not just weird, there's something fundamentally off about them. You know, they, they, they pride themselves on not caring about others. Right. They, they pride themselves on a sort of um, anger as a validating emotion for any belief. And the idea of compromise is, uh, to, to to you know be Verboten. weak, it, yeah, it, it's it's to be weak. Yeah. Um, you know the idea of of you know being kind is weak. Um, the idea of just governing, fault. Stu. The idea of just governing, governing. as adults yeah. is because governing means you govern for everyone. It doesn't right. mean you just govern for your party. So they're un completely uninterested in any of that. Just like the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the rest of the the Kook Caucus over there. They are completely uninterested in governing. They are interested in being professional trolls. And that's what you have now. And, and you know, you have the story about uh, McCarthy uh, recently and how the, the establishment Republicans, you know, the donors, the corporate Republicans who think that, oh, it'll be just fine once Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans take back over again. No, they're worried 
because they're because now it doesn't look like the Republicans are going to have the wave that everyone thought they were going to have months ago. And right. the smaller the margin, if they do in fact take the House back, the more powerful the crazies become because they they can't afford to lose twenty or forty of them in this, and they're going to be ungovernable. Like they're, the the reports out today, they're like. We're not going to be able to control these people. It's going to be absolute chaos if Republicans take back over again. Well, look, I think it was I think Rick, somebody warned them about that. Well, I, you know, we've been all, Rick we've been Wilson is, is the first guy, uh, first person I heard say that, uh, that Kevin McCarthy's not going to be Speaker of the House. He's kidding himself. Right. And I've never I never mean, really was ahead of me on that one. I might have been. I might have been because I said uh, that I, he'll I, never I, sniff well, the hope speaker's you guys, um, <laughs> and, and, and proof that you're right is look at that when he held that press conference and he had Marjorie weird three names over his left shoulder. So this is the people you have to compromise with. And you how do you it's, it's, you can't compromise with these people. All right. Um, they, they are crazy and they are evil. Yeah, this is evil. It's and terrible. they are against the American experiment. And part of the essence of that is being willing to lose, being willing to admit you're wrong, be, be, being willing to admit that you know, another side carried the day in a valid uh, debate. And they won't do any of that. As, um, Reed, as Reed Galen said about McCarthy, he said, if he ever does get the speakership again, he'll be with a bit in his mouth and a saddle on his back. <laughs> but I think they're going to put his I think they're going to put his head on a stake. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. And, yeah. you know, the Germans used to have this thing that if you had nine normal Germans sitting down and one Nazi sat down at the table and no one got up, you had 10 Nazis at a table. Right. And I think that there's a lot uh, at work here, that the failure to call this out mm -hmm. uh, is, is a time when it, you have an obligation not to be silent. And this is what happened to the party. It was just a complete collapse. So you end up with these people. Um, who, who are, there's just, I mean, from John McCain to, to, to uh, Blake Masters. Right. I mean, that's, right. Uh, Sad it, jump. that's not an ideological, and that's just a. From, from Mitt Romney to Donald yeah. Trump. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, in, in not that, you know, in, in, in not that um, long of a time frame. Not that many months. That's right. That's right. I, I gave a speech when I was in Germany and at a summit, and my speech was about the Vichy Republicans, to your point, Stuart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just say that there was a former member of Con Republican member of Congress in the audience who took issue with my characterization of that and um, tried to turn it around and say, well, you know, that there was a, an inflection point. It was January 6th. I do agree with you on that. But what about the media and how the media treats conservatives? You claim you're a conservative. You don't think that the that the media, uh, you know, plays a role in attacking conservative values. And I said, let me tell you something right now. It's your buddies. You just proved my point. You just sat there and, told, and said that January 6th was an inflection point and that was a bridge too far. And yet you're still making excuses and 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 trying to deflect from what the party allowed. If I said your buddies in Congress were the ones who said, oh, they were all up in arms on January 6th, but then within two weeks, they were back bending the knee, fealty to Trump when they could have cast him out then. You know, I one said, of the, uh, and the, then and then you try to deflect and say, oh, it's the media. I was like, that is a cop out. And I and I said, and don't sit here and try to tell me that you're right. you're a victim. Try being a minority female Republican. So that speaks out against this Trump. notion that we believed in a personal responsibility. Right. Yeah. So you're going to blame the media. And, you know, the example I always use about this is it's hard to find a president who got worse press unfairly than George H.W. Bush. Right. <laughs> I mean, time. war hero attacked as a wimp, a youngest Navy pilot shot down. I mean, right. this guy's an American hero. Right. And it didn't make his son bitter. Right. I mean, it, it, it didn't make George W. Bush. He he, he he doesn't wake up every morning and say, I'm going to get even because what they did this to my dad. Um most reporters found him, they may not have liked his politics, but he liked them. He liked talking to them. He liked engaging with them. Um, he didn't blame them. You, you, you don't, ultimately, you are in control of your own emotions. You, you can't have some excuse to be uh, angry and bitter because, you know, it's somebody else's fault. Um, or decide to throw out the Constitution and democratic norms, institutions, and ideals right. because your ego is bruised. <laughs> well, on that yeah, note, we're gonna why, wrap up the we're gonna wrap up the show.
to, to write a book called It Was All a Lie. That's right. But if you true. really believe this stuff. Right. You, you wouldn't act this way. That's right. Um, and your book was was uh, life changing and eye opening for me. And I told you that when you wrote it at the time, Stu. And that was before we really got to know each other. And um, it's uh, it was really it was a tough it was a tough read for me. Just like um, uh, Tim Miller's book too. It hit it hit home really mm -hmm. accurately. Well, as we wrap up the show, we're going to lighten it up a little bit because you know. There are there is some good news. There is we do see some momentum for Democrats. Rick, what do you say? Just because you're doing well, that doesn't mean you take your foot off the gas. What right. do you say? Run like you're 20 points back. Keep moving. That's right. That's absolutely right. And by the way, sometimes that stuff starts to pay off in weird ways. I don't mm -hmm. know if she can pull it off, but all of a sudden in the last couple of days, all these Republicans in Oklahoma of all places, <laughs> like Oklahoma stand are endorsing Kendra Horn, the Democrat for governor, because the MAGA candidate for governor is so far off the ledge that in Oklahoma. So, folks, that's a sign of what you got to do. You got to keep that hustle going, because if, if you suddenly open up spaces like that, where there's even a shadow of a chance of possibility of somebody like Kendra Horn winning, you go do the work. Yep. Yep. Same thing. I think it was the former Republican Speaker of the Oklahoma State House, right? That came out yeah. and endorsed the yeah. Democrat. Well, three former statewide officials, apparently, or two statewide, one one uh, uh, legislative official. I don't know what's happening out there, why that's happening now, but there is an outer boundary, folks. Even in the most conservative states, where the right. craziness of the MAGA world hits that wall, people go, oh, "Okay, that's enough for me. I'm that's off." Not this who I am. Yeah. You know, there's there's, there's none of these. Most of these parents don't point to these MAGA crazies and say, I want my kid to use that person as a role model. I would and not. it's, it's um, at a certain point, I think you hit sort of a decency speed bump and it makes you think and stop. Good way of putting it. You know. Yep. Yep. Well, as we close out the show today and we want to thank everyone as always for supporting us and supporting the amazing content that uh, LP has been putting out. You're looking at two of the gentlemen who are, who help her, write and produce a lot of those wonderful ads along with the creative team. Um, we hope that you, everyone uh, goes ahead and, and helps out Florida and donates to some of those great organizations we mentioned. And we're going to close the show on a little bit of a, a funny note. Um, I believe it's called DJ Trump, the Wilmington, North Carolina remix. Your favorite president to me. Have you ever heard of me? We got to get Donald Trump, Trump, Trump. We got to get Donald Trump. We're going to get him. We got to get Donald Trump, Trump, Trump. We got to get Donald Trump. We're going to get him. We got to get Donald Trump, Trump, Trump. We have to keep our country gay. We have to keep our country gay. Long and hard. We have to keep our country gay. We have to keep our country gay. Long and hard. 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 President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 no drug problem. President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 no drug problem. President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 no. I know a lot about tractors. Peekaboo. Laughter is good like medicine, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. We'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, Stu.